Hi guys, welcome back to the Ask Imaging channel. Tonight's session, uh, first a short presentation to kind of guide the uh, conversation. Sorry, I'm thinking I'm hearing that echo, maybe not. Um, and uh, then uh, we'll open it up and discuss, uh, I was joking with the guys earlier, uh, what I'm saying wrong, or uh, maybe elaborate on the points that I've made. Uh, that said, before we jump into that, I do want to show off our image of the week. And uh, that uh, image of the week goes to uh, Bruce Bronstein for this Rosette Nebula. Uh, really cool object and uh, really nice processing job on it. Um, uh, as always, you can go to our website, theastroimagingchannel.com, and... Uh, Submit your images for consideration and check out past images, comment on any, <coughs> excuse me, past images, uh, or uh, just check it out. Um, also at the same time, because I just got this comment last week, we are not monitoring the YouTube chat. Uh, there is a chat on YouTube. We completely ignore it. Come to our website, theastroimagingchannel.com. And you can watch the video here and participate in the chat, ask your questions, whatever it is you want. Um, our chat pops out. Uh, so what do I mean by pops out? Well, I'll show you after I pause the video so I don't hear that horrible echo. There we go, video pause. So our chat right here pops out. That's our live chat right there. You could pop it out. That way, if you wanted to, you could watch us on regular YouTube just with that chat popped out. or I don't know, enjoy our website, whatever you think. Uh, okay, that's it. That's all I got. Uh, on to the presentation. Um, after I find that window back. And sorry for that infinite window of death uh here we go imaging from darker skies how and why okay uh how and why i guess those are the two most important questions but let's start first with why darker skies um these are actually uh to me at this point very obvious uh but when i started imaging i honestly had no clue that i had to take this into account um for the most part, uh, image quality is the primary reason you want to go to darker skies. Uh, at the same time, darker skies make processing images easier. Or I should just say, uh, good quality subs uh, are easier to process than poor quality subs. I guess if you put it that way, it makes a little bit more sense. Um, but at the same time, it saves time. What do I mean by it saves time? Going to darker skies saves time. Well, light pollution or just any sort of unnatural light or non-object light uh, is a form of noise. And the only way to overcome that noise is with added imaging time. So what you end up finding is uh, the amount of time required the, the, required to image the same object to the same signal to noise ratio um, is considerably less at darker skies. Uh, a red zone, uh, let's say you need to put 10 hours in on it, you might be able to get the same in a, bl a, a blue or a black zone in literally 10 minutes. Uh, it is that significant. So forget about the drive time, forget about basically uh, all the complications, all the packing up, all that time is basically minuscule to the amount of time that you would actually save if you were going to try and image the object to the same quality. Now, this is the real world, so we're actually not trying to do that, What right? We're going to have to settle when we're in a red zone for a poorer quality image. So drive to darker skies and your image quality will be better. Um, at the same time, you'll also resolve more of the object. Uh, when we're imaging, uh, the longer you image, the more you're going to pull the object out from the background. In this case, the more you're going to pull the image out from any sort of 
um, uh, by, by shooting from darker skies, uh, you're going to take that light pollution out of the equation. So you're going to be image, imaging further out into the object. You're going to be able to image and resolve darker parts of the object that you might not be able to accomplish from lighter, uh, brighter skies. And because of that same reason, there are going to be just more objects to choose from, more dimmer objects to choose from. You're, you don't have to cut off your objects at a specific magnitude. If you're used to uh, <clears throat> hitting galaxies that are, say, a 9 magnitude and say, okay, I know at an 8 or a 9 I can resolve them. I might not be able to make them beautiful, but I can resolve them from my red zone. Well, from, a dark, from darker skies, you might be able to go to further objects, resolve them, and, and possibly show off more of them. But there are some challenges involved. I'm going to quickly go through the challenges and uh, then elaborate on each one. But finding darker skies, yes, you have to find it. Getting to darker skies, yeah, you have to get there. Remembering everything. For some reason, this is probably the most difficult. Uh, but I'll, I'll show you my techniques. Powering everything. Um, this is a popular one because, yeah, we, we have to power it. All this stuff runs off electricity. So we have to find a way to do it. Excuse me real quick. I need to take a drink. Okay. Um, having the weather and moon agree. Um, you do, yes, of course, the weather has to agree, right? But also, if you're driving to darker skies, you want to go uh, when the moon isn't a factor. You want to go during a new moon. You do not want to go during a full moon. Um, you basically want to take the full advantage of the darker skies. Um, setting up properly, another uh, factor to take into consideration. Running the imaging session and breaking down. Those are the challenges. It's basically what we do every time we go out. But uh, when you go far away from your house, you have to get every one of these things right because sometimes driving home isn't an option. Sometimes driving to a Lowe's or a Home Depot isn't an option. And we know that sometimes driving to the store that sells the uh, replacement whatever for the uh, S-Big camera isn't an option. There aren't many telescope stores out there. I don't think there's going to be one within driving range of your darker skies. But <clears throat> finding darker skies. Um, good ways to find darker skies are actually club observatories. Uh, yeah, club observatories tend to be in darker skies because... The club members know what they're doing. Uh, they're not going to put their club in the middle of uh, some uh, city, although some are. Uh, and I would just, uh, if you're considering going to uh, a, a club observatory for darker skies, don't go to one in the middle of Boston. Um, pick one that's on, yeah, the outskirts of Boston, I'd say. <laughs> but uh, no, but, but club observatories in general, you, uh, if there's, if, if, the club has an observatory somewhere. You're basically safe to say, and, and public nights, public observing nights, you're basically safe to say that it's going to be darker than the city that's probably around. Uh, at the same time, state parks, uh, good places to go. Cherry Springs is among the darkest uh, skies in the east uh, or on the east coast, as they say. Um, and uh, it's the closest blue to black zone to me that there is. Um, but... My very close Lackawanna State Park, where our club also holds observing and imaging nights, um, is also very dark. And it's not a blue zone. It's, I think it's actually uh, in the, not the yellow, but kind of the mustard colored region here. And it's pretty dark. Uh, even what I go to for dark skies is uh, in that mustard colored zone. And our club observatory is in the mustard colored zone. So blue and, and black skies are very, very rare. Uh, go to the darkest skies you can, you can get to, and you'll be much better off than the red zone. And my house is right there. I don't know if you can see with my mouse cursor, but my house is right there deep within that red zone, uh, about as, center, uh, as central to the, of that red zone right there as you can get. Uh, but uh, this is 25 minutes away. So quick drive and I'm there. But state parks give you a place to actually set up legally. 
uh, you know, you can't just uh, up and uh, dump your gear onto someone's lawn and just start going. Uh, maybe if you have their permission, but uh, it's uh, it could be risky. So you do have to think about it and actually find a place to go. Um, another uh, thing is if you're into campground, uh, campsite, uh, camping, campgrounds uh, also tend to be in remote locations. Another good uh, option. Uh, but, uh, you're trying to find something, you're trying to find a general place to go. How do you do that? Uh, and there are a couple websites that offer that feature. Uh, the one that I use most frequently, jshine.net astronomy, uh, astronomy slash dark underscore sky. Uh, you'll have to read it there and type it in. Uh, or if you just got, if you type dark sky finder, you'll bring it up. Uh, but then there's also a dark site finder website, which is actually new to me. I just discovered it earlier and it overlays what looks like the same data onto, uh, I don't know, a cooler looking map. Uh, but um, if you are, uh, for me, it's not so difficult. You know, I, I know which direction I have to drive to find darker skies. Uh, but if you're in a place where, uh, if you're in a red zone that's surrounded by red zones, uh, you might not be looking for the darkest skies. You might just be looking for the area where the skies kind of, uh, where the, the light pollution kind of parts and uh, maybe find just like a mustard colored zone buried, uh, surrounded by red zones, just so you can get a little bit darker off. I know uh, some of the people in Northern New Jersey would struggle with something like that uh, if you're close to Manhattan, um, but a 15 minute drive can go a long way, even in that particular location. Getting to darker skies, transportation, consider your space. Now, if you're driving around in that right there, you're going to need a really small telescope and a really small mount. Um, uh, you know, if you've got a if you've got an SUV, no worries. Uh, but if you uh, a large SUV, no worries. But but if you're like me, you've got the the wife and the kids and the telescope, possibly the dogs. Uh, so yeah, you have to consider your space, which is why uh, smaller portable tracking mounts are really attractive. Uh, whether it be for the newcomer or for someone who just wants a simple portable setup. Um, I've, I, I say this a lot. Uh, I say two things a lot. First of all, I say with telescopes, bigger is always better. Uh, but bigger is always better right up until it's too much of a pain in the butt to carry. And once it deters you from wanting to actually use it, then it's useless. Uh, so a small, simple setup really uh, could be handy. Um, at the same time, when I say a small, simple setup, you don't have to go with such a small portable tracking mount as this, but you could go with a smaller mount, a mount that's maybe 25 pounds as opposed to 50 pounds. Uh, put a wide field telescope on it that with the camera, with all the doodads and whatnot hanging off the top, maybe you're at 15, 20 pounds. Uh, it's just lighter is easier. Everything goes a lot quicker and, um, Sometimes uh, if you are, uh, if you're afraid you're going to get frustrated with the process or if you're anxious about the process, you're just not going to do it as often. And uh, what you want to do with this stuff is really take advantage of every clear sky. Uh, remembering everything. Have specific boxes and cases for everything. Um, there's a website called mycasebuilder.com that lets you uh, custom design inserts, foam inserts for whatever case you can come across. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the good thing about this is you can literally uh, put an insert in for every item you have. So you put your camera in there, you put your lens in there, you put your battery in there, you put your cable in there, you put your adapter in there. When you break up, uh, excuse me, when you uh, break down or when you pack up or when you put it on, if every hole isn't filled, you know you left something on the ground. You know that there's something out somewhere. You have to find it. You have to put it away so that it's there for you next time you take it out. Um, uh, my other suggestion is uh, keep as much as possible assembled. Uh, I actually, on my wide field setup, I'll leave my camera installed on it with most of the cables attached. The only, the only things I'll detach would be things that I'm afraid might jostle or really get damaged. But uh, for the most part, um, I leave my camera, my dovetail, 
my power box, my USB distribution all together on top of it. And that way, uh, of the five to seven items that I'd have to assemble and plug all together, uh, I'm not worried about it. I've got them all in one tight package. And I've designed some of my cases to actually hold the items partially assembled. Um, things like cutting the foam out for the dovetail so I could leave the dovetail on the bottom and the top. Uh, just little things that every every step of the way I've said, you know, if I did this, uh, my setup time would be that much less and it'd be that much easier. And you get to the point where your setup time just reduces to nothing and you're, you're so familiar with it that uh, it becomes a cakewalk. But uh, the important thing is doing the same thing every time. Uh, next point here, bring everything. Uh, what do I mean by bring everything? Have you ever said to yourself, uh, you know, should I bring my, I'm going I'm to use a terrible example here. Should I bring my eyepiece case? Um, and, and you say, my eyepiece case? What am I going to use my eyepiece case for? I'm not bringing my eyepiece case. Uh, drive an hour away, set up, and you know what? You need something that's in your eyepiece case. And you said to yourself, should I bring my eyepiece case? And you decided against it. No, do not do that. Change that frame of thought. Should I bring my eyepiece case? Yes, because if I don't and I get there and I need something in it, I'm going to be so frustrated that I just should have brought it in the first place. Bring everything and bring extras, specifically USB cables, uh, anything that could break bring duct tape, bring uh, twisty ties, uh, uh, zip ties, anything anything that it can. Um, and in remembering everything, uh, make sure that you're doing an organized breakdown or had done an organized breakdown in your previous session because breaking down in an organized fashion means setting up in an organized fashion next time. Powering everything. Uh, one thing we love talking about are batteries. Uh, make sure you've got enough batteries. Most recommended is a deep cycle RV battery or a marine grade battery. Uh, they can handle very deep discharges and charge right back up. And at the same time, uh, they tend to come in larger uh, amperage, uh, uh, amp hour tradings. Uh, this one I believe is 125-ish which should get me two full sessions with powering all of my gear with the exception of my laptop, uh, which I use a separate battery for. Um, or sometimes I will actually try and get AC for my laptop because that actually consumes a lot of power. It's an older laptop too. And the one benefit of the newer laptops is they tend to consume less power. But uh, at the same time, they might be the biggest power draw in your system. Um, you, uh, I use power poles to distribute power. Uh, it allows me to just kind of plug and play stuff and quickly uh, plug stuff in. I'm not as concerned about tripping over power poles and, and unplugging them as I am things like lighter adapters. Uh, they just seem to be a little bit better. And uh, they offer, if you see at the bottom of the picture there, uh, just distribution centers that can be individually fused. Uh, so it's a little bit safer, a little bit more organized. Uh, at first, I didn't get it. I didn't get power poles. Why would you want them? Uh, but uh, having plugged in and unplugged a million times my gear, uh, I realize now. Also, bring your charger. Bring your battery charger because uh, you never know what's going to happen. You might, uh, for some reason, your battery might discharge overnight. Your battery charger might not have come on earlier in the day. Uh, Bring it. it. It goes right back to what I said. Should I bring this? I don't know. Could, am I really going to need it? Don't weigh it. Bring it. Having the weather and moon agree. Yeah, you can check the weather a million times. Um, the weather channel. It doesn't mean it's going to be clear. But it's better to go or to try and go out on days when the Weather Channel says it's clear. That said, the Weather Channel does not give you enough information. I use this website, cleardarksky.com slash CSK uh, forward slash um, to, I, I have this set up for my observatory. Our club has one 
at their observatory and it's close enough to my other dark site that I can rely on the club's observatory uh, basically to give me conditions. Um, when, when the uh, weather channel says partly cloudy, that might mean that there's four or five perfectly clear hours to image and then it's going to get a little cloudy and then uh, maybe it'll get clear again. That's what this clear sky chart tells you. Uh, and I know the Weather Channel has the hourly breakdown, but it really isn't designated for astronomers. Um, if I were to look at the Weather Channel, it's probably going to say clear all night. But if I look at this clear sky clock uh, or clear sky chart, I can see that at about 2 a.m., I'm going to have to start worrying about some clouds. Um, gives me a little bit more information about the seeing quality. The other thing it tells me is the darkness down here. Now, if the moon, uh, if there was a full moon, this would be bright. There, there would be no blue dark band right here. Uh, this would be as bright as, um, I don't know, this would probably be as bright as these light blue boxes here. Maybe it would almost look like this, uh, um, the sunset kind of continued on. The moon is a huge factor. That's why I said avoid avoid uh, full moons. Uh, try and go a, a, as close to the new moon as possible. Setting up properly. Well, as you set up, you're gonna basically undo your breakdown, right? Did you remember everything? Well, I hope so. Which way is north? Uh, you might want a compass for this if uh, if you're not familiar with your site. Reassemble as you broke down. Uh, Polar aligning. You whatever your routine is, you're just gonna have to polar align. Knowing which way is north definitely helps. Calibrating guiding, imaging. It's basically it's our setup. Running the imaging setting, and I'm I'm gonna rehash a little bit of this. How how well did you set up? Uh, you know, if you didn't tighten something down perfectly, you might have images. Are you automated? Um, if you're automated, uh, maybe your target is pre-planned. If not, you're gonna have to go to manually. Uh, but if you're automated, maybe you're pre-framed. You're either going to basically click start and it's going to plate solve or frame manually. Um, this is just your routine. This is what you do whether you're at home in your driveway or uh, a million miles away. It all comes down to how well did you set up? And that basically comes down to did you remember everything? Um, when you're good to go, you just start imaging. I'm rehashing, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it right back up. Breaking down is the opposite of setting up. Every item has a spot, whether it be in your case or whether it be in the back of your car. Uh, keep the same items assembled. If you're used to not taking your camera off your telescope, don't make today the first time to take your camera off your telescope because you're gonna put that adapter somewhere. You're gonna put the camera somewhere else. Um, Try and make it as routine as possible. Do the same thing every time so that you'll recognize it when you're doing something different and you're forgetting something. Prepare for the next session by being organized. And uh, most important thing, check the ground because it's probably dark out there. Um, I have left tons of stuff on the ground uh, and uh, I've sent other people looking for it and it, you never find it. And uh, why do we drive to darker skies for images like this? Uh, this is Vandenberg 152. Um, I, this is a collaboration I did with Josh Smith. Um, he did it, I believe, from Florida, and I did it from my darker site here. Uh, and it is a combination of uh, H-alpha emission nebula and reflection nebula. Uh, and uh, the uh, and there's a planetary nebula in there, uh, which isn't processed so well, but it uh, it's it's right there uh, at the bottom. Uh, the greens didn't come out as well as I would hope for. Uh, that's what I'm gonna have to go back to. But yeah, this is uh, an object that really requires dark skies. That dust, uh, that dirtiness, is actually up there. And uh, I want to say that we had about 120 hours into this one from darker skies. Uh, this, is the th my, this is my favorite image that I've ever taken. Uh, I don't think it's the most visually impressive image that I've taken, but uh, it is definitely the image that I put the most effort into. Uh, between Josh and I, 120, images, uh, 120 hours of 
uh, imaging time and probably about 25 hours of legitimate processing time uh, just because there were so many frames and so many aspects to deal with. That is it. Uh, I heard a lot of bleeps and bloops, so I'm guessing that I have a bunch of questions. Let me take I, I, Adam, before we get to that, why don't you read the questions? I'm going to make some comments on what you had to say. Okay, go right ahead. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and read through the questions and stuff like that. Um, when Adam was first talking, he was talking about how um, um, why you would want to go out to a darker sky, and he may brought up some important points. Uh, basically, you're increasing the contrast a lot because you've got a blacker background to whatever it is in the foreground that you really want the picture of. So that's that's pretty obvious. But one thing he didn't mention that I think it'd be significant to bring up is what makes skies brighter? Well, obviously the sun and the moon, duh, we got that part, but light pollution. And you see, light pollution has colors. And light pollutions come from generally one side or the other. It's not universal across the sky. So your background sky that you're getting when you're in a bright, light polluted area is, um, it's going to be uneven. It's going to be brighter on one side than it is on the other side. And that's something you're going to have to deal with in processing. Uh, it's also going to be the wrong color. It's not going to be that just a uh, little bit blue, uh, just about black kind of thing that you want. It's probably going to be a little red or a little orange or something like that. So going out to the darker skies um, gets you better color, fewer gradients, and that's a really important part when you're starting to talk about uh, processing, the ease of processing and stuff like that. Um, I can see that this is a, a uh, this, this presentation today was organized for those on the East Coast. And I want to remind you that out on the West Coast, we do have a lot of Bureau of Land Management um, land. And it's basically free and open land and you can basically camp almost any place out there that you wish to camp. Um, back east, it's really hard to get away from light pollution. Out west, it can be hard to get away from light pollution. There's always something around. But usually within, if you drive an hour or an hour and a half, you're going to get away from it, um, depending on where you live, of course, and stuff like that. And many times you could just pull off the side of the road out in the desert or along some ranch land someplace and um, there won't be any cars coming by and stuff like that uh, expect particularly if you've got an rv or something go for it um, you, you could do that kind of stuff i would suggest that don't just look for a dark sky site when i was a star party director for the riverside astronomical society i would go around to various campgrounds all over southern california and ask you know the ranger there about uh, where we could set up for a star party. And he said, oh, you love this campground. They, they said, I mean, it happened over and over uh, with so many different rangers, so many parts. They're really proud of their campgrounds and they're real nice and shady and they got trees and it makes for a really nice campground. And you look at them and say, no, 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 I don't want trees. You know, I want some place where I can set a scope up with an uninterrupted view of the sky. So just because it's in a dark area doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be good for you. Does it have access to electricity? It's really cool if you can get electricity because all those problems about batteries and stuff like that really disappear when you've got electricity. Third, Adam went to a lot of trouble to talk about um, how to pack everything and all that other stuff. Well, it may be that you don't even know what to pack. That's why I would strongly suggest that if you haven't imaged out in a dark area yet, you make sure you image at home a few times. You set up just what you're gonna use to image in your backyard. You might get poopy pictures. I mean, you're gonna have this, this orange light dome over your head and you can just barely make out the Andromeda galaxy in, in, your, in your DSLR. That's fine, but can you track? Uh, how long does your battery run? Uh, experiment with all these kinds of things. And then when you've got it working just right, then take it apart and put it in those nice cases that Adam talked about so that, um, so that it's all there. Then put all those cases together and before you leave, 
make sure you take all those cases okay so it's not just a not just putting things into those cases that you think you might need you put into those cases things that you actually needed during your practice runs and um also when you're out there one of the things that I, it wasn't mentioned but uh, we are going to a dark sky site and you are probably a source of light pollution yourself and you have to be conscious of that um uh, larry was out at um, our site last night and he um set up his rig out on one of the pads at, at goat mountain and um he looked at it he says oh my god that light is bright and it was just a pilot light you know one of the leds coming off of I don't know his guide or his power supply. Uh, it was it was his uh, his imaging computer. Just the power supply light sitting up at the top of a um, of his telescope was bright. He wound up borrowing some black tape from me, and he taped it over. Uh, what are you going to do with that monitor screen of yours? If you're going to a dark sky, if you're going to my dark sky site, and I'm sitting there trying to find my last Caldwell objects and you've got a computer monitor sitting next to me i got problems you know i got problems and you should have problems and you should figure out what you're going to do about those light pollution problems that you are causing when you go out to the dark sky site and finally I, I, adam didn't mention it i was just taking notes as we go through um you may be used to doing certain things at home with internet access, uh, power supplies and stuff like that. Well, power supplies we've talked about. But remember, there's a, there are some things you do now and then, uh, things you check on. Uh, if you have to do a blind solve in Sequence Generator Pro, uh, you can do it either with Ansvar, which is a local setup on your computer, or you can do it by going off to the internet, Astro Tortilla, you can go off to the internet on it, okay? You're used to doing that. Well, you may not have the internet out wherever you are. So when you're going to a remote on that dark sky site, um, you set your computer up to do those blind, blind solves without needing a remote connection. Um, anyway, those are some things that, that I would have, um, I, I think that uh, should be in tonight's presentation um, about you know, how, how and why you wanna go image under a dark sky. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, you know what? You 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 made that point about uh, not going out to a dark sky for the first time or for your first session. And I almost I I, I should have made that point uh, myself. I, I was thinking it the whole time. Uh, you're you're breaking down the setup that you've imaged within your driveway. That's how you know you've got everything with you. Um, if you uh, you uh, try and take your brand new mount out of its uh, packaging box and your brand new OTA out of its packaging box and set them up at darker skies, you're going to have troubles. Uh, make sure you've done at least a few dry runs. You know, I do dry runs before I do outreach. I do dry runs just in my driveway, like just to make sure everything's there in the light during the day so that you can see it. And, um, that's uh, one of the ways you can avoid the gremlins. Anything that can go wrong at any point. Uh, actually, I shouldn't even say that. Gremlins, gremlins, uh, I feel like if you forget something or if you've done something like that, that's not the gremlins. Gremlins are things that go wrong for no reason. Um, but I gotta, I gotta interrupt you if you don't mind for just a second here. I gotta tell you about Mount Laguna. This was like 15 years ago. Mount Laguna is one of the darkest sites in California. It looks out over Mexico and it's really dark in Mexico out there and stuff like that. It's about two hours away from San Diego at any rate. And it's up about 6,000 feet and it's beautiful. And this guy shows up with a new scope and your new scope comment triggered this memory. It was so new it was still packed in all the bubble wrap. And so he's unpacking a new scope in the dark, uh, not bubble wrap, but those little popcorn balls. And he couldn't get it to work. He got mad and left. And he didn't bother picking up all the popcorn balls all over the place. Um, he's an example of what doesn't work. So just to interrupt, interrupt it. Just imagine all those popcorn balls all over beautiful mountain Laguna, Laguna's metal.
we picked we had to pick them up the next morning for him. Okay, sorry for the interruption. No problem. Uh, so yeah, as I uh, as I look through the comments, what do I see? A near unanimous uh, uh, near unanimous agreement uh, that uh, clear sky chart or clear sky uh, clock uh, doesn't uh, isn't as accurate for a lot of people as um, uh, clearoutside.com. It may be using the same data, but it's probably visualizing it some way, something that makes it a little bit more accurate because a lot of people are saying the same thing. Uh, also, Medio Blue, which is another one I've used, uh, but Medio Blue and Clear Outside uh, both let you set your location and work. Clear Outside has an app, so you can get it on your phone or tablet or whatever little device you've got. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, oh, and the other point. Harbor Freight is having a sale on cases this weekend. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, Pelican cases cost like three, four, five, six hundred dollars for for the ones that had fit a uh, telescope or. Uh, a, a large camera and image uh, and lens setup or uh, a mount. Um, and for a mount and for a DSLR, it, it's probably worth it. Uh, for um, cables and uh, adapters and uh, the million for extra batteries for. Uh, basically, all the little things uh, th that we're going to have, uh, a Harbor Freight case is perfectly sufficient. Uh, it doesn't have to be waterproof. It doesn't have to uh, survive a nuclear disaster. Uh, basically, it has to survive a trip out into the dark skies and then a trip back. And there's very little you can do to damage an adapter. Uh, there's very little you can do. Storing it in a $500 case isn't going to make that adapter much safer. Uh, your telescope, yes. Your mount, possibly. Uh, your DSLR, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, there's things that are going to get bumped into and, and really you're not going to worry about. Uh, your flashlights, your uh, compass, your um levels your all those things you've got to put them somewhere because if you forget them if you don't have a spot for them you're going to forget them and uh while everyone else is out at the dark site imaging uh you're going to be wishing you remembered your eyepiece case um oh yeah uh the some people okay uh, another point uh those uh Tupperware or Rubbermaid storage bins, um, you can store your items in them and then you can they can double as laptop enclosures. Uh, so I've seen a lot of people using them. Um, but yeah, I think uh, a lot of people, a lot of people that have been doing this a while, if you want better images, you're not gonna be able to settle for just staying in a red zone. Uh, you can go to narrowband. Um, and that'll overcome. You, you'll get great narrowband images. But for RGB images, if you want to image some emission nebula, or excuse me, some uh, reflection nebula, uh, or some of the dimmer galaxies, uh, really, uh, there's no substitute for driving to darker skies. Um, what tools do you use to measure the sky's darkness? Uh, he hears about the Bortle scale. Uh, what's that? Um, so I can't speak to the Bortle scale with any uh, authority at all, uh, only to know that it's, it's um, a, a, a scale that basically gives you an idea of how dark your actual skies are. Um, I've... Adam? Yes. You know, can you see my screen share? Yes. You want to talk about it? You, uh, it's basically Hold on. what the... Uh, Bortle scale says, and a Bortle of nine means you're in the, it's like the inner city sky, it's white, 4.0 at best. This is simply a, I guess it's a Bing of a Bortle chart, 
or something. And a city sky is white and it's 4.1 to 4.5 limiting magnitude naked eye. And um, it goes, you know, as it goes, goes from there. And when we talk about getting into the fours and the fives, we're talking about getting into the greens and the blue areas. And where we want to go is to the one, which is black. Um, anybody else want to contribute to that part of the conversation? The only thing I'll uh, contribute to it is um, uh, Samir Karusi has a website which allows you to use a, uh, which gives you a process to use a DSLR camera to, I believe, uh, oh, do we get the Bortle scale measurements on that or is it the limiting magnitude? No, I think it is the Bortle scale. Um, but basically to use a DSLR to give you, uh, to kind of quantify your sky's darkness and apply it, I believe, to the Bortle scale. Um, so basically it's just a way to compare the sky's darkness of different sites. Um, and yes, Alex just brought up the map that, that uh, is the same map that is in one of those uh, uh, clear dark sky or dark sky finder websites um, right there. Yeah, lots of red zones out on the East Coast and lots of dark skies on the West. So anyone else in the room have any comments, uh, things that people should know, uh, misconceptions, anything? Because if there isn't, it's going to be a relatively quick session tonight. Um, I uh, do, uh, I do um, have some more formal sessions coming up in the future. Uh, I'm getting a few of them scheduled now. We might continue to have open sessions, though, when we uh, don't, uh, when we can't get someone booked. Um, and remember, an awful lot of you guys out there, you ladies out there, can actually contribute to this. Uh, there are, I mean, just say that, look at the richness of the comments over in the comments section. Obviously, you folks have a lot going on. And believe me, we're not magic over here. We just kind of put it together in a little simple PowerPoint and, and talk about what we, we can talk about. So please contact Adam and tell him that you'd like to do something about your favorite topic, something that we haven't covered or something that we have covered that you feel that you've got a special twist to. Um, I'll take an off topic question. Uh, have I found SGP's recommended exposure time to be accurate? Uh, yes and no. Um, I think that for it to be accurate, you need to uh, accurately fill out all of the specs of your camera. I'm trying to think of what the, I think the read noise and all of that has to be in there. Um, and if you haven't characterized your camera, then it might be a little bit inaccurate. Uh, but uh, sometimes it hasn't worked for me. And I'll tell you, I don't really rely on it. Um, so I, I don't know if I'm going to say I've seen it accurate or not. I'm actually not going to comment on whether I've seen it accurate or not because I've seen it inaccurate and I've seen it uh, off the wall, not, at, uh, not where it's supposed to be, but then at the same time I've seen it where it is. And I've always assumed that it was due to my not putting in the right settings. Uh, but um, I, never, I never really needed to rely on it. Um, are, are there any L, uh, light pollution suppression filters that help? Broadband filters for RGB. Uh, I had used the IDAS LPS uh one of them I, I i honestly can't remember the designation because they've had they've had they've had a few of them now and the one that i have is discontinued um but uh the the i believe they're hue tech manufactured idas filters uh depending on what particular um wavelengths you're looking for uh and the aggressiveness of it uh they might have better or worse options um but yes, they're helpful. Uh, if you're in uh, heavily light polluted sky, sometimes you might not be able to get the object you're looking for unless you have something like a light pollution filter. Um, uh, 
<clears throat> you know, I shoot narrow band, so I would not be able to pick up anything without my narrow band filters. Uh, but they, they allow me to. So, and it's the same, I'm not gonna say it's the same concept, but basically it's, uh, reducing everything that's not signal or as much as possible. that's not signal. Uh, as astronomic sells them, uh, the Orion sky glow is a good one. Uh, or I, I think IDAS, uh, the Hutex have really probably been the premium ones. Uh, and I think they, uh, they're probably the most vouched for that I see. How do you compare a new moon in a red zone and a half moon in a blue zone for narrow band imaging? Uh, it's impossible to say because it almost depends more on the um, uh, how. Uh, I'm sure how sharp the cutoff of the wavelength is. Um, uh, if it's a three nanometer filter, you can get away with a little bit more moon. Uh, if it's a eight nanometer nanometer filter, a full moon or even a partial moon is going to be an image uh, is going to be an issue. Um, the the issue with the moon um, is more the gradient it, it gives you when you're very close to it. Um, once the gradient isn't really an issue, then it's just the brightness you're looking at in the background. It, it's really hard to compare. Um, that said, narrowband imaging is the most resilient to both moonlight and um, uh, light pollution. Um, but but my, 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 really the comment is, my experience has been different than other people's experiences with almost the exact same filters, but different gear. Because some gear might show reflections from the moon. Uh, my RC, for some reason, if the moon is near what I'm imaging, um, I, it gives me ugliness in the image from some reflection somewhere. Uh, it's not the moon. It's not the... Uh, gradient it's some sort of moonlight reflection um so it's hard uh, really hard question to answer uh i did see a comment pop up in here you can image oh yeah and of course of course of course uh you can image hydrogen and sulfur with the moon high in the sky uh the o is uh, a lot more difficult and uh the moon should never even partially shine down your scope which is basically what causes all those issues for me um i with my past scopes it wasn't that much of an issue um i'm sorry i'm just reading through we didn't do too bad for time today I always feel like we either go way too long or, or way too short. Um, should you use a light pollution filter in darker skies as well? No, um, because you are actually cutting out signal. Uh, and I have heard that Astro Don himself isn't a big fan of light pollution filters. He says, uh, don't use it. You're cutting out the signal. Just deal with the gradient. Which makes sense, right? Except sometimes dealing with the gradient is difficult. Uh, I guess it depends on how good of a process you are, processor you are. Um, hmm, switching from YouTube to a website, lost the video. I don't know. I'd have to check it out. I did have a issue with the website earlier. I hope it's not a a product of that, although I haven't seen any other complaints, so I think we're probably good when it comes to that. Um, okay. Hey, Adam. Yes. Um, I think you're still clicked on somebody else. Um, you, you we're just showing the TAIC oh, label, so I turn yourself you. back on. Ah, you want to see my face? There you go. Well. Or my screen, whichever. But yeah, uh, I, like to, I like to. I like the refrigerator. Yeah, I closed all my cabinet doors. For you. So unprofessional. 
<laughs> we actually got a complaint, guys. We actually had somebody send in a complaint that it, it <laughs> this is so unprofessional. You guys are putting on this big show. No, we aren't. We're sitting around our house <laughs> drinking orange Fanta. And uh, I mean, it's not that big a deal, guys. Sponsored by Orange Crush. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> This is where I do all of my imaging and processing from, so it's fitting. You would expect there to be a, a telescope, uh, and uh, be in an observatory and a telescope behind me, but uh, that would mess up with my uh, lighting, so. Yep, so I think, I don't know, uh, that's, uh, that's basically it. Um, more of a presentation, less of a discussion today. Maybe we'll try and do the opposite next week. Uh, you know, if uh, I'm, I'm coming up with these mini topics on the fly. If you guys have mini topics, send me a message uh, via the contact form on the web contact form on the website, and um, maybe I'll get a few topics that we'll be able to uh, question over in YouTube chat. Um, sorry, I don't monitor YouTube chat. If if you throw it in here, if if it pops in front of me really quickly. I'll try and answer it. <coughs> it actually takes me too many clicks to get to YouTube chat, and then I've got uh, the echo sound. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to get to it tonight. Uh, thank you guys. Um, thank you guys for watching. Uh, we'll see you next week. Hey, submit some web, uh, sub submit some images uh, on our website and. Uh, I don't know. Thanks, guys. Pipe organ. Um, ask your question. I might have to say we're going to get to it next week. Uh, I'm not sure how, how quickly it's going to come in. Yeah, but same is true of what we're saying. Research before spending any money on any product. Uh, pipe organ, cloudynights.com. Uh, go on there. Uh, it's a forum. Ask your questions there. If you can't wait until next week, uh, because I don't want you coming on next week and saying, I bought a this, 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 this. Is it good? Because we might say no. Thanks. All right, guys. Good night. Uh, see you next week.